Cranky Geek Fall 2022 is brought to you by Google, Spearline, Crisp, and Daily. For more information, see the links in the description. Hello, with me, Hello. Is, with me is Philip Henke, who is like with us from the beginning, I guess, uh, in Cranky Geek and other stuff. So you are here today to talk about advances in audio codecs, and I would say in audio in general. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So if we look at audio in WebRTC, that has, for the last decade, meant the Opus codec. We also have G711, which is the PSDN codec, but we don't use that. And there's this famous image from the Opus homepage for it's a comparison between Opus and a lot of other the codecs that were trying to compete for the best audio codec 10 years ago. And it shows the bit rate on the x-axis versus the quality on the y-axis. And it's a bit tricky because the quality here really means the frequency range of the codec, so narrow band, wide band, super wide band, or full band. And the goal you have for your audio codec is to be in the upper left corner, so what the red arrow shows. Full band audio at a low bit rate. And Opus is getting us closer than all the other options to that point. And it has a range from 8 kilobits to 128 or even 512 kilobits per second. And the way Opus is achieving that is that it is a combination of two codecs that have been existing at that point. One codec is Silk for voice, which was the codec that was done by the Skype folks. And the other codec is Silk for music. And Silk has certain configurations, so one for narrow band, another one for wide band, and a third one for full band. And similarly, Silk has two different modes for full band audio and full band stereo. And if you take these modes and configurations and put them together, you end up with that green curve we've seen initially. And over the years, Opus has improved considerably. So in version 1.2, 2017, five years roughly after it came to WebRTC, we got full band audio down to 14 kilobits per second, which almost eliminates this need for the white band silk variant. Similarly, for Celt, we got super white band music style audio up to or down to 32 kilobits per second. And version 1.3 in 2018 was even better because then that pushed the envelope in this lower left corner. So we get wideband audio already at nine kilobits per second and silk style audio in narrow band down to five kilobits per second. So that was a considerable achievement. But then in 2021 and 2022, we had new two new codecs. One was Lyra from Google version one in 2021 and version two in 2022, relatively recent. On the other hand, we had Microsoft pushing the Saturn codec into Microsoft Teams in 2021. And they got us much closer to the goal, which is the red arrow, but they do that at the cost of CPU and battery life. And if you read the blog post on those codecs, you will notice that people spend a lot of time optimizing them for both CPU and battery life. So let's look a bit at Lyra and Saturn, what they do. Lyra is really built for this low bandwidth use case. So 10 kilobits or less. And there it outperforms Opus in these scenarios. So this picture from the Lyra version two blog post shows a Mushra score, which is a listening test score. And you can see it beats Opus at these bit rates, but at the higher bit rates above 10 kilobits per second you would rather switch to Opus because Lyra is a standalone codec. And if you have more bandwidth, you can just switch in between. And Lyra version two is also a big achievement over version one because version one still had this algorithmic delay in the codec of 100 milliseconds, which made it unusable for RTC. But they pushed that down to 20 milliseconds in version two, which is the same order of magnitude that Opus has. And something that came up two weeks ago when I prepared the talk and I was really happy because someone did a demo using WebAssembly in the insertable streams to bring this to the browser. 
you can play with it, meeting dev, lab, library, web RTC, loopback, HTML, and you can really play with it and it shows how little bitrate it uses while it still sounds absolutely great. So I don't hear much difference. Problem is there is a catch. If you look at the statistics, you will see that the blue line is the payload byte sent and the black line is the amount of header bytes sent over the connection. And that's the default configuration, so you can tune that a bit, but we're sending roughly twice the amount of header information compared to the actual payload of the codec. And that doesn't even show the SRTP overhead, which is another four kilobits per second. So we're using one third of the data to encode the audio and the rest is overhead. Not great. Satin, on the other hand, is very different from Lyra. It is extending Opus in it, or you could say that it is extending Opus and it has a low rate and high rate mode. And it does seamless switching between those at a configurable bit rate. Like Opus and Lyra, it is variable frame size and 20 milliseconds delay, so suited for real time. And if you look at a piece of audio recorded and then encoded using Silk and Satin, you can see that in the picture, Silk at six kilobits per second cuts off the frequency and the signal at four kilohertz, but Satin goes up to 16 kilohertz. And in terms of quality of the voice experience, that's comparable to the difference you hear between Opus and G711. So that's a big, big achievement. So what should we do? Should we wait for a Opus version 1.4, which is going to push the envelope even further inside Opus? But I don't think there are any plans for that currently. Should we build a brand new codec like Google has done with Lyra? Microsoft has done with Saturn? Or should we maybe do a multi-audio codec strategy where we sometimes use Lyra, sometimes use Opus, sometimes use G711 even? But if we look at what Opus is, it's really a container format. So the first byte of the packet on the network, or the first byte of the RTP load, payload, is describing the format of the rest of the packet. So that's the configuration, as I say. And for that, no SDP negotiation is required. It all happens in band. But once again, there's a catch. You can have a perfect codec, but what happens if there is packet loss? I mean, codecs are really nice, but only half the story. So what happens if a packet is lost during transmission? And I tried to do that from the browser, drop packets, and what you see if you look at the waveform is that you get this gap in the audio waveform. And what you can do about it is you can pretend it didn't happen. This is a technique called packet loss concealment. And then what you can do is to just replace it with silence or maybe white noise. That's a 20 year old approach. Or you can do what the WebRTC jitter buffer, NetEQ, which is something that Google acquired from Global IP Solutions back in the day, and repeat the last audio frame with a slightly different amplitude. And that works well for gaps of 20 milliseconds, but it breaks down somewhere around 60 millisecond gaps. So if you lose one packet, that's okay. If you lose three consecutive packets, not good. And what we've seen in the last two years is advances which basically use AI to replace that missing bit with a generated waveform. We've seen that both in Microsoft Teams, which has great advancements there, as well as Google's Netic, wave NetIQ that is used in Duo. But what can we do on the other side, on the sender side? So if we lose a packet, we have several methods in WebRTC to deal with that. So that's called audio resiliency. And the basic method is negative acknowledgement, NAC. Basically, if you lose a packet, you ask the sender to send it again. Low overhead, if it, there's no packet loss, no overhead. And it works on low bandwidth networks, but it requires low latency and only works for sporadic loss, so sometimes. In terms of control surface, we have SDP for that. WebRTC support is there, but it's non-standard, not enabled by default. Facebook tried to use it. And the downside is really that it's reactive. So only after you lost the packet, you do something about it. If you need to decide whether to use it, I would say it's probably not worth it. 
the default method in Opus is something called inbound forward error correction. So basically you send a reduced quality version of the packet along with the, or of the last packet along with the current packet. And that is still applicable to low bandwidth networks and it deals with low to moderate loss. This whole thing is controlled by the RTCP fraction loss. So the percentage of packets that you lose, but it only works up to 25% because it's capped there. WebRC support is there, it's been there forever. And the downside is really that you get a reduced quality because the fact bitrate goes out of your target bitrate for the audio encoding. But is it worth it? It comes for free. It's what you get by default. But how good is it really? And when we tried to get another mechanism called red into the browser, we did some measurements and this was done by Ring Central and they measured Polka MOS, which is an audio score as a function of packet loss. And you can see the green line is what happens if you have packet loss and you don't have OpusFact, if you have explicitly turned it off. And that degrades by a score of 1.0 out of five at 5% 5 loss already. So that's pretty bad. And with FAC, get a much more linear degradation in the score as a function of packet loss. So 0 0.25 at 5% 5 loss difference is largely 1.0. So that's pretty big in terms of MOS score. And this works pretty well. I mean, every WordPress call also uses it by default. But there's another technique called red or redundancy. And basically the principle is that you put a full copy of your past packet into the current packet, append it to it, or you maybe do two or three past packets in the, along the current packet. And that requires a higher bandwidth, but it tolerates moderate to high loss even. In terms of control surface, there is a default version in WebRC in Chrome, but you can use insertable streams to really do whatever you want, do your own strategy. So I'd say WebRC support is partial. It's there in Chrome and Safari, but not in Firefox yet. And the downside of this approach is really the high overhead. When it comes to whether it's worth it, I'm biased, I would say yes, but that's why I brought it back in Chrome 96. And if we look at the results, again, done by Ring Central, it is beating Opus spec even if you have one redundant packet. In particular for the very common video conferencing range of five to 10 percent packet loss. It's already a good improvement over FAC and it's always on. So it doesn't require any packet loss before you start doing it. If you increase the redundancy to a factor of two, so current packet, past packet, packet before that, you can get to 15% without drop in quality and 20% if you have three redundant packets or 35% without degradation in score with red four. And that's great, but again, what's the catch? Because it doesn't come for free. So red N means you have N times one, N plus one times the opus bitrate. So 32 kilobits per second roughly times five for red four. So that's 100, 50 kilobits roughly, but that might be okay if you send two megabits of video along. Bigger problem is that there is also latency increase which is proportional to the amount of redundancy. We haven't solved that yet. So use with caution. Big question is where are we headed in terms of audio quality? I mean, what you can do already, you can use Lyra today you don't need to wait for Google to ship it in Chrome. You can just use WebAssembly and insertable streams as we've seen in the demo. You can even, and I did a demo for that, that extends the other demo, integrate Lyra into Opus. So you replace the Opus pair load for some of the rarely used configurations that are for low quality silk. You just use Lyra there instead. On the receiver, you just selectively easy decode the normal Opus stuff or you use WebAssembly to decode Lyra to a format called L16, which is basically unencoded audio and then feed that into the WebRC pipeline. Works great. The other thing you can try to do, and again, I have a demo for that as well, 
is a low overhead redundancy. So you use Opus as primary payload and Liar and WebAssembly as secondary payload. And encoding works and you get really the overhead, but at a low bitrate cost. The sad thing about this is that the WebRC NetEQ jitter buffer does not support receiving two primary payload types. So that's something that needs to change in the browser maybe. But this style of encoding is still useful for SFUs who have more flexibility to do some advanced stuff with packets. So you can do basically do simulcast style stuff for audio, which is pretty interesting. So where are we, we headed with this? I would say Opus has fared quite well. I mean, it's 12, 13 years old now, if you look back at Silk. But there's a lot to learn from Lyra and Zeppelin because they pushed the envelope really a bit closer to this magic goal in the upper left corner of the graph. But maybe Opus will just integrate the lessons of Lyra and Zeppelin. Maybe it will even just take Lyra as one configuration and Zeppelin as another. This will require a break in the bitstream format, but that's just a technical thing. It's hard to do, but it's not complicated. Or maybe we are going to start combining redundancy with the modern codex. The problem with redundancy is really that you have this doubling or tripling of the bitrate for a packet loss event that rarely happens. And we don't even have good numbers on how much rarely is really. And Lyra and Saturn can do this at a much, much lower bandwidth cost, which makes it much more attractive to do the strategy. Or, which is something that we're currently discussing in the WebRC working group, we just make insertable streams a bit more capable of supporting these use cases, which basically puts the application developer, puts you in the driver's seat. So you can do whatever you want. You don't need to wait for anyone. And we'll see how the future works out. Thank you to our sponsors, Google and WebRC.org, supporting web real-time communications. Spearline, guarantee a better customer experience by testing, monitoring, and benchmarking your voice and video communications. Crisp, Crisp's AI solution removes background noise and echo from meetings. Daily, build communications into any application.